Good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome to everyone here. It's good to see a couple of you that I haven't seen in a while and uh, some other folks that are here and some of you see all, all the time. So uh, I hope everyone's spiritual needs are met by uh, having our fellowship and worship this morning. So let's start by passing the peace to each other and welcoming everyone here. Peace be unto you. Let's make our way back to our seats. Uh, once again, good morning. All right, so the next thing we have is to go over some the announcements and the schedule. So we will be having an elders meeting right after church today downstairs in our usual room. Uh, that means disciples' bells will be later this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, Tuesday, we have Lunch Bunch at Blue Ember. That's 11.30 on Tuesday. Chancellor Choir Rehearsal and Crazy Crafters have their normal spots there that you can see there in the bulletin. Youth Group will be meeting uh, next Sunday, November 5th. Uh, looking ahead, November 12th, we'll be having our uh, Thanksgiving celebration and Veterans Day uh, celebration and David Trent wanted to let, let wanted me to let you know that uh, he is in the process of putting together uh, and updating the Veterans Memorial video that we've played in the past. If you're uh, if you or your loved ones uh, are already featured on that before, they're still going to be there. But if you still have, there's still time to get in some more pictures into that. So if you uh, if you have those. Uh, he'll take those all the way through next Sunday. Uh, the easiest way is if you can get it somehow in electronic form and, and get it attached to an email, you can send it to him at spirodt at yahoo.com. This information is also in the newsletter. So if you can get those to David, he can, he can get those in there for you. Uh, okay, so prayer concerns. Uh, Greta Pryor was uh, in the hospital recently, but is recovering at home now. And she, but she, she would like to still have our prayers. I know she'd appreciate that. Um, Alan Maxey and his family request prayers, continued prayers. And the Fosters are requesting prayers, our continued prayers for little Warren. And uh, we, you know, John, we don't you know that, that he's been in our prayers for a long time and, and we're gonna keep him there. Um, are there any other concerns I need to know about at this time? Fair concerns. We should all be concerned about all those that are having to uh, deal with, with strife and, and war in different places in the country. And, and of course, we always should, should keep those, uh, for whatever reason, those folks who, who can't be with us because of health reasons. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, Let's go now to some, some other things. Um, this is a, a celebration and announcement. Jim and Linda Creekmore would like to invite everyone to celebrate their 25th anniversary with them on Saturday, November 4th at 6 p.m. And uh, it'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall for a, for a reception there. So it sounds like a, a good time for everybody. So, wonder, so congratulations on that upcoming <laughs> celebration. 
Um, any other celebrations that we'd like to bring forward? This is your time to let us know. Yeah. Trey, 16. All right. Happy birthday, Trey. Oh, my. Fantastic. Well, welcome back and welcome home. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any, are there any others? All right. Well, if in case anybody didn't hear some of that, basically thank you to everyone for the great job last week on the Artemis Festival, Artemis Project, and the uh, festival that went with that. And uh, congratulations all around to everybody. Anything else? I have one more. I have a letter here. This is from our, uh, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but this is from our regional minister, Nadine Burton, and it says, Dear Ellis, and to summarize, Ellis has now been uh, given a um, status of, um, of uh, standing in our region, in our denomination, and he's on his way toward ordination in disciples. So he's just got a couple of stages left. He's got one class to do and a couple of things to check off. And he will be switching his ordination from Baptist to disciples. And awesome. congratulations. To all.
you would remain standing for our call to worship. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thy ear to us and grant us thy peace. Thank you, O Lord, for gifting us with a new day. Day we have never seen before and when it's past, we will never see it again. Thank you for the privilege of bowing before thy holy and divine presence as we lift our hands in praise, for you are worthy to be praised. We come to lay our petitions on the holy sacred altar on behalf of those who have asked us to pray for them. Please comfort the afflicted who are struggling with sickness and health challenges those whose names appear on our prayer list, and those whose names have been mentioned in this service, have mercy on them all. We pray for peace in the world as war has claimed the lives of many innocent people. We pray for peace, unity, and love in our country as we still believe that we are the greatest country on the face of the earth. May this worship service be pleasing in your sight as I offer a special recognition and thanks to the leaders of this great congregation. And we pray this prayer in the name of the one who taught us that when we pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. It's time for our scripture lesson. It can be found on page 323 of the Pew Bibles if you want to follow along. It's from 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 22 through 23. And before I start, there's a measurement in here I want to talk about. It's five cubits. A cubit uh, traditionally was a distance from the elbow to the fingertip. So a standard measure at that time, five cubits would be about seven and a half feet tall. So you can keep that in mind uh, when we read this. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man, a Kabziel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. 
and he killed an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits tall. The Egyptian had in his hand a spear like a weaver's beam, but Benaiah went against him with a staff, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are gathered here as family, sharing love, sharing peace and pardon. But outside this holy place are so many lost and sin. If we keep our love inside these walls, how will they ever know that the words we say are true? peace and joy you know share the light in a world of darkness share the truth that can settle people free be the love of christ let him live in you and me as the ones who Thank you to the Jacksons, to Diana, and to Jack II for your service here today. To Miss White, I don't know if that is still your last name. And then we have another Mr. White over here. So both of them have come back to our place of worship today. And I say to both of you, welcome, God bless you, God speed. And may this not be the last time. Keep coming to this place. Anyone in this church or everyone in this church who has in the past or who is currently serving in any kind of office position, would you please stand just for a moment? Would you please stand? Anyone who has in the past or who is currently serving in an office. I want to say to you that the most difficult job in the world is that of being a leader in a church because you don't get paid to do it. It's volunteer and you work under extreme circumstances and you are not always appreciated or thanked for it. This sermon today is a tribute to you in your service because I have noticed in this church that the leaders step up. And it just makes me feel so good and want to be a part of this congregation until the Lord calls me home. And I want to say to you, thank you for everything you have done, everything you are doing, and everything that you will do. This sermon today is for you. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to talk about doing what needs to be done. Although all honest ways of earning a living are honorable, all honest ways of earning a living 
are not glamorous. All work done in a home may be necessary, but all housework may not be exciting. All schoolwork may be important, however, all schoolwork may not be interesting. All sincere and inspired church work may lead to eternal life, however, all sincere and inspired church work does not have eternal significance. Earthly life would be heavenly indeed if it was solely filled with glamorous, exciting, interesting, and eternally significant tasks. However, life is also filled with non-glamorous, unexciting, uninteresting, and uneventful things which must still be done in life if life is to be complete or even livable. A big time athlete with celebrity status is glamorous. A garbage worker is not. Yet life in this society would become a living hell of disease, decay, and discomfort without the unexciting and dirty work of the garbage man. We tend to run toward the glamorous and run away from the apparently insignificant. However, blessed is the person who is willing to do what has to be done. And that's what this word is about today. It's about leaders, and especially church leaders, who don't lead from center stage, do not require a spotlight, but lead from behind the scenes, leaders who don't get upset if their name is not mentioned. Benaiah, one of David's noble warriors, was such a person. David was the second king of Israel. He was a great king of long tenure, not only because of his own personal courage and fighting abilities, but also because he developed noble and loyal warriors who fought by his side. David was blessed to have good leaders to help him. The same holds true for churches. Any congregation whose plan it is to be a kingdom-building, Satan-busting people of God cannot do so by just having a pastor they like. No matter how able a pastor is, he or she must develop people like Benaiah who are willing to serve by their side. The church needs good leaders, and this church, this church, is blessed to have outstanding lay leadership, especially at a time when it would be so easy to go home and just sit down. You do what needs to be done. The first characteristic of good <coughs> leadership is loyalty and commitment. Benaiah and others not only fought with David, but they also fought for him. When he could not personally be present, when he became too old to fight any longer, David's warriors had not only great fighting skills, but also something else that makes a difference between a winning army and a losing army, between family rather than a group of related people, a community of believers rather than a congregation of acquaintances who only meet once a week. They had commitment <coughs> to their cause and loyalty to their leader. It doesn't take much loyalty or devotion to fight by a person's side 
when he or she is present. True nobility and loyalty comes forth when the leaders are absent and the troops stay together and fight just as hard for the cause. That's what it means to be a true army, true family, a community of believers, to remain loyal and committed to one another in spite of all. I'm so impressed that in the absence of a permanent pastor, every leader of this congregation has stepped up to be counted. Allow me to review Benaiah's resume. Benaiah was one of David's bravest warriors. The text in 1 Chronicles you just heard declares that he fought two fierce soldiers of Moab, either one of whom could have been more than a match for any ordinary soldier, and he emerged the victor. Then after slaying a lion, Benaiah also slew an Egyptian giant who carried a spear like a weaver's beam. He was just like the giant Goliath that David once slew. Brave leaders face great opponents, the kind that will scare off ordinary foot soldiers. Brave leaders have great faith and face great challenges, the kind that mediocre religion is unable to stand up against. Only brave faith in God, like the kind that Abraham had, would allow him to consider giving up his son on Mount Moriah in obedience to the word of God. Only brave faith, like the kind Caleb and Joshua had, made them swim against the tide of public opinion and declare that the land can be conquered and the giants can be defeated while the crowd sees themselves as grasshoppers and victims. Only brave faith, like the kind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, will defy the king's orders and remain vigilant and faithful in prayer and refuse to bow down to golden images at the risk of careers and life. Only brave faith can undertake great things for God and do great things through God. Only a brave church can undertake great challenges while some churches shrink from great risk, fearing failure, the brave church understands that nothing is too hard for God. The brave church remembers that the God whom they serve owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the world's silver and gold. And God has promised to supply all his children's needs according to God's riches and glory. Then the second characteristic of good leadership is being conscientious. Benaiah was willing to do what had to be done. Our text recounts an incident in which a pit had been dug to trap a marauding lion. Snow had fallen and effectively hidden the trap. The lion had fallen into the trap and was unsuccessfully trying to escape. No one wanted the unpleasant and dangerous job of going down into the pit to slay the lion. If the community was to live in peace again, someone would have to face the lion before the lion got out. <coughs> Benaiah had nothing to gain by doing it. He already had enough honors attached to his name. His bravery had been established through his many victories on the battlefield with David. He didn't need to fight lions to advance his career. He could have said, let somebody else do it. He could have delegated his authority and assigned one of the other soldiers under his command to perform the dangerous task. Conscientious leaders, however, 
Don't assign others to tasks simply because they can or because they have authority. Conscientious leaders do not assign tasks to others simply because those tasks they personally prefer not to do. If there is something that has to be done, whether it's unpleasant or not, whether they are asked or not, if no one else is doing it, conscientious people step forward and they do what has to be done. But also know when it's appropriate to delegate. Satisfaction for the conscientious leader doesn't come from the praise or rewards of people. Their reward is in doing the will of God and the satisfaction they feel in solving a problem, lending a helping hand or meeting a need when something needs to be done. Benaiah was a conscientious leader and consequently on the snowy day when others were huddled inside in comfort around the fire, he went down into the pit by himself without a crowd of onlookers, well-wishers or fault finders. There were no cameras. He just did what needed to be done. He slew the lion and brought peace back into the community. Thank God for those who do what has to be done. Thank God for those in the family who, when the other family members become insulated in their own personal concerns and isolated in their own lives, do what has to be done to hold the family together. That also includes church family. Thank God for those in the family who don't forget about the elderly members, who take the time to guide the young, who don't forget to call and minister to the sick members of the family. For many times the tasks <coughs> are too time consuming, nerve wracking or unpleasant. However, if a family is to be a family indeed, then these unheralded tasks have to be done. Thank God for church members who see a need and do what has to be done. Thank God for the church member who will say, Pastor, you don't have to call my name. I can't, I can't do what brother or sister so-and-so can do, but I'll do what I can. I don't want any credit because God has been good to me. I'm just trying to give to the church in my own way because I love the Lord and I love the church. And I'm grateful for what the church means in my life. So whatever I can do, I'm willing to do. Some people see a need and sit back and wait to be asked. No one knows their desire or ability to work yet they will become angry and complain that the same people are always used. Hear them as they complain. They act like sister so-and-so is the only person in the church. I have discovered that in almost every congregation that I have served except this one, less than 10% of the members do 90% of the work. And that's because they have shown in the past that they are reliable and that they can be counted on to do what has to be done. They have established a track record for faithfulness. I would love for different folk to step forward and ask, what do you need me to do? Some tasks are not glamorous, to be sure. Cleaning the church, cooking food, repairing the building, working in the office, helping to fold bulletins, providing transportation for the elderly, feeding the hungry, working in the pantry, visiting the sick, listening to someone else's problems, maintaining the records, attending long and sometimes heated meetings, 
soothing hurt egos. These are not glamorous works. However, if the church is to be a caring community, if it's to be administered in a sound business manner, if God's house is to be kept beautiful, then someone has to be willing to do what has to be done. Somebody's got to have the courage to look in the mirror and ask, why can't I be the person who's willing to go down into the pits of non-glamorous service? Why can't I be the person who says the words to restore peace when confusion has arisen? Why can't my hands be the hands to drive a nail, lift a broom, or send a letter, or make a phone call in the name of Jesus? Why can't I be the person who stands in the gap between problems and solutions, between needs and fulfillment? Why can't I do what has to be done? Why can't I be the one who says, if you need somebody, here my Lord, send me. Thank you, those of you who do just that and more. God bless this congregation, bless its leadership, Lord, continued, committed, faithful, conscientious, dependable. Lord, continue to give them the strength, and not only them, but future leaders. There are some future leaders in this congregation, Lord, and teach us how to bring them up, how to mentor them, that they may carry on in the same tradition as those who went before us, who trained us. Now we're doing the job, and it's up to us to train others to do the job as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, let the church say amen.
Well, now we come to the part of our service when we have our family meal with God and our Holy Communion, and we also have this opportunity to bring our offerings forward. So after the words of institution, I ask you to come through the outer aisles, place your offerings and have communion, and enter back through the center aisles. I'm thinking of of, uh, this, we're commemorating the Last Supper, and this was on the night that, that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Well, Judas was his follower, and he looked to Jesus to be a leader, but the kind of leader that he wanted Jesus to be was different than the kind of leader Jesus was. He was looking for a military leader, someone to overthrow the government. And Jesus was a different kind of leader. He gave us a model of being a servant leader, the kind of leader that Ellis was talking about in the, in the service. And so... As you're taking this meal, think about how we can each become servant leaders in the model of Jesus. The table of the Lord is prepared. The words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink Drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us come to the table.
Let us pray. God, we thank you for the offerings that we brought forward here. Please bless them so that they may do your will here in our congregation. We thank you for this holy meal of communion. Please let it refresh us and renew us so that we may become the kind of leaders that you would like us to be, the kind of leaders that are not afraid to do the menial tasks. And please help us follow in your son Jesus' example. In his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we extend the invitation to discipleship. If there are any, if there's anyone here who desires to unite with this congregation, church family, or want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, this is the time to do so. Uh, as we sing the hymn number 181, the uh, Let's see. Oh, okay, okay. I picked the wrong one. <laughs> Thank you very much. It would help if you read. <laughs> All right. As I was going to say, that in the Chalice Praise Book, uh, hymn number 181, May You Run and Not Be Weary. If there's anyone here, you may come. Beloved, as we leave this place, my prayer is that we will not leave the same way we came, that God has visited us, inspired us, and now we have our marching orders to go out. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us until we meet again let the church say amen. God bless you and God keep you. Amen.